Today on the Daily Review, we discuss UK Netflix documentary, Alien World, with your host, me, Joe LaRocca. <clears throat> Great. What's up, guys? Um, Alien Worlds just released today, I think, or yesterday, or at midnight, perhaps. Um, Alien Worlds documentary fiction non-fiction kind of thing uh four episodes it's got that britishness that's good you know that british voiceover that makes you really feel like you're learning something look at all these little oh geez, all these fuzzies on me it's like there's alien worlds living on my sweatshirt anyway what this is about is about the ideas that the uh, excuse me that there's a million billion trillion exoplanets which are planets that revolve around a sun like the earth we're not an exoplanet because we're in our solar system we call all other planets that are like that exoplanets it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all perfectly habitable for life but it means that probability speaking there's probably some other dudes and ladies out there hanging out doing stuff you know making youtube shows um so uh, which is an idea that I understand. I believe in life outside, you know, I think it's crazy to not think that. So what this does is take a very scientific approach and take, like, apply the laws of life on Earth to what we know about, like, the environment and the atmosphere on these given exoplanets, and they just pick uh, four. And actually, now that, yeah, those the four are real, but I think they're making a great deal of inferences you know it's not fact but they're saying oh if this planet is in fact what we think it is with this type of oxygen richness or this type of um, air density or gravity or all sorts of things then this is the type of life that would most likely develop and then what's really great about it instead of just being like some nerd nonsense it actually shows you the real world proof like a science documentary would um, for how they got to these um, hypotheses you know like one planet the first planet is um, is uh, oh, is it oh, sorry I'm sorry this light is too bright it's bugging me oh it wasn't that light <laughs> it's the light outside hang on the light up all these planets have lights outside there. That's a bit better for me. Okay. Um, mm, ominous. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. So they do They do Atlas, Janus, Eden, and Terra. And uh, I'll have to look to see if these are actual planets that are out there or ones that they're just hypothesizing could exist. But uh, I only watched the first two. And Atlas has a very thick atmosphere, almost like the air is almost like water because the gravity is twice as much as on Earth, which means that things can kind of like float on the wind. Hey, it's Cami World Productions. What's up? Yeah, I watched it. It was really great. Thanks, Cami. I agree. You must be a nerd like me because this just came out like yesterday. <laughs> just like, alien worlds. All right. Click. Um. No, but there's so many um, UFO type documentaries out there, and a lot of them are garbage. Like the host, <laughs> the host, it's like the host will have like a deep V neck and would be wearing like some like a cult necklace and have jet black hair. And you're like, I'm not going to believe you, dude. Do you realize you have to look like the nerdiest scientist ever for me to accept that you have based this on science and not on some sort of like illusionist magic trick or whatever? You're not from like Vegas. Anyway, this is all, you know, science-based. So via CGI and, like, drone photography of kind of unique remote places on Earth, they combine that together to create these creatures. Um, they're really very imaginative and really um, kind of open up your mind to how things could be on a different world. I really love the concept of it and hope they do more. Um you know, um, that first planet is really cool because so it's so they're so thick that they, they would believe that 
um, seeds would be able to just kind of like float on the breeze, which they basically do now if there's some wind. But um, and even seeds have modified themselves, right? Like dandelion seeds to give themselves a little way to propel themselves or whatever. Or like they have little burrs on them, so they get attached to animals, and then animals bring them somewhere. Or animals eat them; they don't get digested, and they crap them out. And then they're, that's one of the many ways that seeds are spread throughout our planet. But in this way, they're saying, oh, they'd adapt to like use that to their advantage. And when they shoot their spores out, they'd really go flying. And that would mean there'd be a lot of seeds in the air, which mean that there would be seed eaters. So, and there'd probably be more flying animals on this planet because once you're able to get up there, you can, you can kind of float on it like water. So they would suppose that these animals would be bigger and maybe even have more wings um, to have better control to like grab food out of the air. So it's like, you know, it's using the scientific process to like kind of guess what would happen. But then it shows a paraglider explaining what it's like to ride the wind in our current gravity situation. He's like, it is like waves. And I look for thermals with birds and then I go over to them and it helps bring me up. And so you go, oh, okay. So there is like science behind this and oh well geez what would it be like and he goes well if there was twice as much gravity you would think that that would be pulling you down more obviously it is but it, what it does to the atmospheric pressure i guess is make it so so much thicker that you can kind of ride it like water i don't even fully understand how to explain it but he was like i don't know it's good and the, the guy who like introduces the show is like i found the first exoplanet i won the nobel peace prize and i'm a crazy genius like uh <laughs> I don't mean any of that in a negative way. Uh, so, you know, just got that, uh, the air of authenticity that is lacking from a lot of kind of imaginative documentaries, you know. It's very heavy on the imagination and not so heavy on the uh, nonfiction, you know. So, just about how life would evolve in different uh, different conditions. Um, yeah, they show another thing where they're like assuming how they would hunt and then they were showing a falcon and how a falcon hunts because it's not faster when it's flying, it's faster when it's diving. So, I don't know, it's cool. It makes you think about the planet, the, our planet as well and how much diversity there is. And it makes like little Star Wars aliens that they've made up look less stupid. <laughs> like, oh, I get it. Maybe that maybe that, that would maybe there would be kind of a frog guy. Uh Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend it if you're into documentaries. And it's just quick, quick, quick viewing. Uh, but I've only watched the first two episodes. The second one kind of grossed me out. Uh, Janus, it's like a, a planet would, well, that they think would, would, would be very, uh, what, uh, it, it's like a fucking insect planet, basically. And so you're like, ugh, insect planet, no. But I'm interested. The last two are, are, are kind of the ones I was most interested in. One's a super oxygen-rich planet, so you get, like, mammalian-type things. And then the last one's called Terra, which is a planet that knows it's dying and how its inhabitants would either have moved underground or how life would evolve on, on a dying planet. Um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I do recommend it if you're into, into documentaries and you're into, like, sci-fi stuff. It's cool. And I know in my class, you know, right now we're teaching one more week, but we're doing sci-fi genre films. And this is kind of cool because it's got, like, I was talking about how you know, the best sci-fi movies actually have a little bit of science behind them. You know, there's some actual ideas. And yes, they go heavy on the fiction side, but having that real, um, like, scientific question being proposed is always fascinating. But I was going to do Die Hard 2, because I just randomly clicked on that, because it's on whatever, Amazon or whatever, or maybe it's HBO. And my God, is, is Die Hard 2 so stupid? I love the first one. I think the first one's like probably my favorite action movie ever made. And it's like they totally forgot what was good about the first one. Like the the relatable characters and the slow build to like an extreme situation that's actually kind of believable. Like a terrorist situation. And then all everything in this one is like elevated just like every action movie sequel. Most sequels just kind of make it bigger. And you go, ugh. But in this, every remember the whole point was that John McClane was just like a guy, and then he gets thrown in this situation. I mean, he is a cop, but he's just like, he's not like, you know, Jean Claude Van Damme, who's like fearless and kicking people in the face, or like, yeah, or like Schwarzenegger. You've never seen Schwarzenegger afraid in a movie ever, right? Uh, and in this, he's like crying, pulling glass out of his foot. You're like, whoa, this is like a real guy. I can relate to this. 
But in World, I mean World War Two. That's what it feels like. In Die Hard Two, he's everything he says is a catchphrase. It's so ridiculous. He's like, you know, someone will be like, "Do you want cream in your coffee?" He's like, "Do you want cream in you?" And they're like, "What?" Like, oh, no, and then I like wink at him, and you're like, "Huh?" It, it, it's so stupid. Everybody talks and like, "How's the window? How's the weather out there?" It blows. I mean, he, these aren't even real ones, but they, they're all like that. You know, he even repeats that. I mean, there's so many repeat scenes, but like, you know, the classic scene where he's got the lighter and he's in the air duct and he's like, good, hey, come to the party, have a good time, have a few drinks, whatever, you know, the classic action movie moment. In this, he just does like an even longer version. He's like, yeah, you come to L.A., you meet your wife, it's Christmas, oh yeah, and then you're just crawling through more fucking ducks. <laughs> I was like, this is, oh my God. Oh my god, this is not done with the gingerness of the first one. Uh, that's because it's fucking Rennie Harlan, who's like, he directs with like a sledgehammer, I think. Uh, that, oh, clarification about something I said in Bombshell. Uh, it's not the women's fault by any means. I didn't, nobody made a comment. I'm just saying when I rewatched it, I was like, oh, that makes it sound like I think the women are as much at fault as people like Roger Ailes. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying it's interesting that the movie brings up the idea of how people who didn't come forward at, you know, were other people who had been abused or were upset at people who hadn't come forward sooner. And that, and that our hero is so heroic that she realizes that she's like, yeah, I was selfish and I fucked up, um, in terms of not saying anything about it, but that it's no way her fault or nearly, you know, I just didn't want me one. just want to double check to make sure that that's not how that came off obviously and uh lastly 2001 space odyssey does not have any computer generated images just for anybody who's watching in class because after class we're talking a little bit and people are like whoa that's so amazing and then someone said oh you know i I can't believe it's all like models and stuff you know and then obviously they do some computer stuff at the end like with the lights and stuff and that's what i originally thought when i saw it you know the jupiter and beyond the infinite sequence and i'm like no dude that's all photographic tricks that's all like in camera and development stuff and everybody's mind was blown hopefully uh especially when we talk about it next week um okay music
stickers for everybody. See, people are actually getting their stickers. I was concerned because I put it in a mailbox that the, the thing wouldn't open, but you could put, pat, like, you could get letters in. And I was like, eh. and so I didn't do it. And then the next day I went back and, I, and it still wouldn't open. And so I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll just slide it in there. And then I was like, wait, maybe it's like out of order or like maybe like Trump has done something in his last, the last days of Trump. He's stopped the mail. He's already tried it, right? Um, what do you, what, what, what are these song lyrics about? She's got a smile that it seems to me reminds me of a childhood memory. Anyway, uh, I recommend this. I think I already said that. Look at that little character up there. I like him. He's cute. I like his little, his little under his neck mustache. Cool. Um... Okay. I think maybe next I'm going to make holographic stickers or pins or ultimately we're building t-shirts, but t-shirts are some real, some real scratch. But you know, I think we're going to make 300 by the end of the year. I don't want to jinx myself. The original goal was 500 in the first year, but that was way before. Um, oh, sweet child of mine. Yeah. Oh, sweet child of mine. That's all I really want to do is karaoke on here. Is, does this sound like Sweet Child of Mine? I don't think so. Maybe at some point it did. All I listened to was Aerosmith. The mailbox was active. Anyway, so that's good. Um, that hurt too is very stupid. Uh, anyway, yeah, check this show out. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. By craft work.